go your own way. Were you very angry? Oh, absolutely furious. Of course we were. We had plenty to be angry about. We still do. Kill men now, ask me how. It was a badge that we had mass made for a meeting. I mean, we were pretty tough and probably quite alarming. Yes, we were bloody angry. And some of us still are. William, stop it. Come on. Sorry. In the late 70s, politics in Britain became more extreme. As the state moved dramatically to the right, the left began to fragment. The women's movement was already an established political force, but now a group of women splintered away from the mainstream of feminist thinking. They called themselves the revolutionary feminists. Unlike the socialists, who pictured a revolution where the ruling class and the working class would be on opposite sides of the barricades, revolutionary feminists declared war on men. It all began in Leeds. Men grow bold as they grow old. They all lose their charms in the end. All men are wankers, said Christabel Pankhurst. Women are a girl's best friend. You have to be enraged. I still have the rage and I still carry the rage. Rage is absolutely fundamental, not anger, it's not strong enough. It has to be rage. Sheila Jeffries came to Leeds as an academic and was the revolutionary feminist's leading ideologue. I was in socialist feminist groups in the early 70s and what concerned me about socialist feminism is it wasn't naming men and looking at the power relationship between men and women. It was all what we used to call women and, women and Ireland, women and this, women and that. So I was very concerned to problematise the role of men. I was in a London socialist feminist group with Sandra McNeil and we wanted to reorientate the politics so that we could look at what men were doing. And that's where revolutionary feminism came from, really. It was 1978 at the Birmingham Plenary when we stepped up to the microphone and said, men are the enemy. Or oh, you can't say men are the enemy. You will split the movement wide. We must stick together with the male left, an analysis they will provide. Make the coffee. Mind the baby. Don't make such a bloody fuss. Your oppression is due to capitalism. It's got nothing to do with us. Did you feel a sort of generalised animosity towards men at that time? Uh, certainly, yes. I did feel very, very, very angry with men. And that was partly some of my own experiences. It was certainly came out of listening to a lot of other women's experiences and just looking at who was in control in the world, and particularly in terms of violence against women and the way that men used violence against women or its threat to just control women in every area of their lives, really. <laughs> was a very straightforward, uncomplicated feminism which proclaimed men as the problem. And it was not poverty, it was not class, it was not race. Did you define women as a class? Yes, absolutely. Women were the, work, they were the equivalent of the working class and men the ruling class. Under patriarchy? Under patriarchy, that's right. So we hoped to abolish the class difference. We were told by men on the left that 
ours was a bourgeois cause that we had to wait until the proper revolution before we could then say that women deserved liberation. We didn't agree with that. We knew that actually what we deserved was freedom from the tyranny of male oppression and we were going to get it by any means necessary. Women who are socialists are prepared to give up many things which they might enjoy because they see how these things tie into and support the whole system of economic class oppression which they are fighting. They will resist buying Cape apples because the profits go to South Africa. Obviously it's more difficult for some feminists to give up penetration which is so fundamental to the system of oppression which we are fighting. The revolutionary feminists advocated what they called political lesbianism. This meant becoming a lesbian for political reasons, whether you fancied women or not. We were heterosexual women who were on our side. But what I could never understand, and I did resent, was them going home to men at night. It just seemed such a contradiction. And often I would get very angry when I would challenge them about this and they would say, well, that's just the way I am, I just don't fancy women. Having no understanding at all of the fact that sexuality is a social construct and that we all make choices depending on the way that we want to live in the world we want to see. Strong, 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 strong like an animal. The politics of revolutionary feminism were disseminated around the country and permeated the women's movement. The extremism of the revolutionary position was a challenge to many women. Being a lesbian is not compulsory. You can't say to a woman who's sort of happily married and bringing up children, whatever, you now politically have to leave your husband and children or whatever to... You know, that, that, there was a, there's a nonsense of that. It's not something that you can ask or demand that everybody does. Was there a contradiction or an issue for you that you would go to an all-women's group, a feminist group, and then go home and sleep with the enemy? A contradiction? No, there wasn't. A, I was quite clear that I felt OK about that. Um, I really thought about it a lot, gave it a lot of thought, and I thought, no, this is, this is what I've chosen. I've got every right to choose this. I'm quite clear about why I have and why I'm staying with this. And if other women don't like that, then I can't help that. So, no, it didn't cause... I gave it a lot of thought and a lot of time, but it didn't cause me that much difficulty in the end. Could you tell me what the word lesbian means to you? Well, it means um, two women making love to each other. Yeah, you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I know I, I said at a certain point, in fact, I wrote something at a certain point about how I wasn't going to be... I wasn't going to enter into this lesbian stuff because I was just too bogged down with childcare and I liked my husband too much. It's a woman that's doing an unnatural, um, an unnatural sexual act. With or is it with another woman? Uh, a few years later, <laughs> the things changed. I certainly have been introduced, I guess, to the idea of lesbianism, to the possibility of it through being in the women's liberation movement. But it wasn't until um, I met someone who was completely outside the women's liberation movement that I found myself falling pell-mell into lust and I was completely overcome with this desire. I was involved in a blind women's tape magazine and as a result of reading articles about lesbians which weren't about pipe smoking, you know, sort of besuited kind of butch people of indeterminate gender like Radcliffe Hall, but were actually ordinary women like me, I began to realise that the feelings I had for um, women and one woman in particular weren't an aberration or a crush, but were actually about being a lesbian. And that was like, that was very important to me. So being a feminist brought me to lesbianism as well. If it hadn't been for feminism, oh. You know, I'd be married and stripping the woman next door or something, you know, I wouldn't... I very much doubt that I would have had the energy or the, uh, the creativity to live a lesbian lifestyle. Oh, God! <laughs> um, Immediate response. Well, a female homosexual, I mean, that's... And what would that, that entail? Well, nothing much, I mean, it's just the sign of the times, isn't it? It doesn't mean anything to me. 
my main experience of it was that it was a bit of a pain because there were all these women who suddenly wanted to be lesbians. They didn't actually terribly want to sleep with women, but they sort of felt they ought to, to pay their dues. And I don't know what it was about me, but for some reason I was the next best thing to a straight man to be tried out on. And I do actually remember one night a perfectly nice woman with whom I'd had nothing but friendly relations, deciding that this was it, she was going to become a proper feminist and go to bed with me. And she, I remember her stroking my breast and saying, oh, it doesn't feel strange at all. And I thought, well, this bloody does to me. <laughs> I fell in love with a woman and suddenly a huge crisis for me because I'd been, you know, for all intents and purposes, heterosexual. Anything other than heterosexuality had not occurred to me. Changed my life in an absolutely radical and revolutionary way. And and it was wonderful, quite traumatic. And I have to say that it wasn't desperately easy for my husband at the time either. really believed at the time that the vast majority of women would eventually withdraw their energies from men and then we'd be at the position where men would want to respond against that and that could create a dangerous situation where there would be barricades between women and men. Uh, when men became really angry and realised what was happening we thought that they might be violent to us and that we would need to defend ourselves. We did have discussions about what to do in those situations. I don't think any of us really thought guns were the answer. I really can't remember that, thinking that. When we went on marches and things, we used to take things like those little sort of plastic lemons with a cap on it, and if men were going to be violent to us, we thought we would squirt them. We had sort of self-defence devices, but um, not actual weapons. <laughs> it would be the combined ranks of the army and the police force versus... The squeezy lemon! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Pending the armed struggle, the revolutionaries, along with all good feminists, challenged received notions about how women should look. They wanted to be free from the oppression of making themselves sexually attractive to men. We rejected makeup, we rejected hair colouring, we rejected the kind of clothing that would make us look as if we were sexual objects, and we wore clothes that were more practical than feminine. I guess we, we epitomised the sensible footwear brigade <laughs> wing of the feminist movement. We felt that high heels were unnecessary. I thought it was really important to wear shoes that were comfortable, that were practical, that I could run in, that I could run away from people if I needed to. High heels are thoroughly uncomfortable. They're very bad for you in the long term. They give you spinal injuries. Um, they distort the, muscular, the muscles of your legs, which then goes up to your spine. They're bad for your feet. They give you corns. There is nothing, nothing, nothing good about wearing high-heeled shoes. If they were so great, men would wear them. I just thought, great, I haven't got to wear these bloody stupid shoes. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a real liberation for me, sensible shoes. Uh, and it was just to be able to move properly. It wasn't just shoes, it was bras, it was... Um, boots, you boots. could wear boots and yeah. a dress. It freed us up, it enabled us to do a lot more things. You had to conform to a certain way of looking. There were certain behaviours. There were, I mean, not no makeup. Oh heavens, no makeup! The very idea. Women took great pride in not shaving various bits, and um, those that did have to shave because you know they were too hairy to do that, it had to hide the fact that they were shaving. I think we are acceptable. Yeah, it'll do. 
I used to ride in the London Tube and I'd hear these women sitting opposite me as well who'd worn these shoes all day and they'd say, can't wait to get home, I just want to put my feet in a mustard bath and she'd ease the shoes off and the friend would say, oh, can't wait to get home and do that too and I'm sitting opposite them thinking, I want to end pain. I would like to end women's pain. It's a reasonable thing to think that we can live in the world without pain every day. You got into doing the... Oh, what was it? Yeah. Was it that? Yeah. Oh, it was that? That's it. Yeah, we got into that quite a lot. You know, the feminist vagina thing. There were women at the time who, who, uh, who felt that the word woman or women actually contained the word man and men and therefore should be changed, that they felt that the, word, that, that the language was so male-dominated. So they started to spell women differently, W-I-M-M-I-N, for example, to completely get rid of the word man inside that. The last thing you wanted right in the very core of your identity was the word man, excuse me, that just so completely had to go. So we explored all kinds of exciting things. We talked about ourselves as women, W-I-M-M-I-N, or women, <laughs> which is W-O-B-Y-N. Sometimes we left um, the B out and then it was W-O-M-Y-N. Um, but it was all about us. Keep the focus here. Keep the focus female. Keep the focus feminine. What was the B doing in the womb? So it was womb, women, as in that. So we turned turned women, W O M E N, into W O M B, womb, in Y N. Actually, I thought that was rather clever, actually. <laughs> the word uh, history, although I think everybody knew that it didn't really have anything to do with his story, was changed to her story, H E R S T O R Y. You could get too precious about it and um, get to the point where you couldn't say, oh God, you had to say, oh goddess. And um, you couldn't say, um, um, hey, you guys, um, or you couldn't say, oh boy. So I didn't, I didn't go too far in, in the direction of trying to kind of change every single linguistic quirk in myself. Um, but at the same time, I, it, was, it does irritate me when people just um, assume that all animals are generically he. Good boy. Good dog. Not a dog, is a bitch. You changed your name. I did. Why? What was that about? Well, I didn't want to have my husband's name because it was actually, well, obviously I didn't like my husband at all, so I wouldn't have divorced him. And why did you not simply revert to your family name? Well, because it was the same thing. Well, why, why would I want to take my father's name? And so I just, got, I just made up a name. Mm, you know how I got it. I got it off a clock. I found this uh, with my partner at the time. We found a clock, like it was a bread shop clock, big, nice clock. It was all in pieces, but the face of the clock, it was a bakery shop and it said, no bread, and then at the bottom, like Hemmings, yeah? And at that time, we were hippies. Bread meant money, no bread, like Hemmings. So I thought that's gonna be my name. My name is Lisa Power, and every now and again, somebody nudges someone and says, she wasn't born power, you know. And I wasn't, uh, and the joke on that has always been that I thought about what do women need, and I didn't want to call myself Lisa Money, so I called myself Lisa Power. As well as eliminating men from their language, women began to think about eliminating men from their lives. Were you separatist? Oh yes, we were separatist. Um, there were times actually when we took it to a ridiculous extreme. But often I would walk into town rather than get on the bus so I didn't have to actually deal with men who would chat to me. I would more or less tell men to piss off in the street if they started to chat. And if I was in a greengrocer's and I was called darling or love, then I would challenge it. I mean, it was well over the top, but at the time it was actually quite exciting. And there were women who removed all the books in the house that were by men from that house. As far as I was concerned, it seemed impossible to find out who we really were as women while men's thoughts were still around and what could we really be and 
who could we really become and what would a woman's culture look like and what would a woman's world look like? How could it work and how could it be organised? This time, this time I'll tell them the truth I'm sick and tired of lying and concealing the reality I've known since I was 16, maybe all of my life I'm a die, I'm a die, I'm a die Everything at that time would have been women only. It became a really big issue about whether or not we had men in the house. At, at the time, none of us had any male friends. Um, you know, if we needed something to be done in the house, like a plumber or something, we would have tried to find a woman plumber. Kath Hassel was a lesbian, a plumber and a separatist. I just lived with women, worked a lot just with women on, on some of the projects, but I was also um, working with, with men. But it was just kind of this... Um, it wasn't really they, 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 they were the enemy. We didn't need them. I think that was more the point. We didn't need them. Like, we were lesbians, so we didn't need them for sex. They were just a bit of a pain. Why live with them? And then you'd have to clean up after them. My brother came down to visit me, and I was living in a lesbian separatist house, and I still wanted to see him. But so I just said, well, you can't come in. Your girlfriend can come in. So she came into the house. You'll have to stay out in the car, mate. <laughs> and, you know, my brother loved me so much. He said, yeah, OK, that's cool, you know. And, and then we took him a cup of tea out in the car. You know, that was sort of sweet. But it, I think it was, it was really important for me to just be with women. I do not need to justify myself. By the time we became an all-women household, most of the older people had got used to the household. We didn't cause any trouble in the street, actually. We were quite an advantage. Um, but the people who didn't like us were the men. There was a group of young men living up the street who just taunted us. They were frightful, throwing stones, shouting, carrying on. And there was one neighbour opposite, uh, a single man, who put a photo of himself naked through the letterbox. And we found this Polaroid of this man. <laughs> I don't know what that was supposed to be all about. The thing is that the, all the harassment that we had, if we called the police, they were just not interested at all. So we had no recourse. I mean, we used to spend a lot of time sort of thinking about things like, you know, would it be any different, you know, if we all sort of clubbed together and bought an island somewhere and then all went to live on the island, what would happen? You know, would it be this utopia or would women end up having the same sort of hierarchies and oppressive structures that you get in a mixed society. The most extreme separatists argued that the planet should be reorganised, with men and women living on either side of the equator. The worst separatists would argue, for example, that there should be a wall around the equator and that all... Yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, part of me would still think that'd be quite good now, you know? Apart from, apart from obviously, all the blokes who are my friends. <laughs> At that time, I would have thought that would have been great. What was the logic in terms of how the human race would reproduce itself? Well, even then, we were aware of huge technological breakthroughs. There's, there's many ways in which the human race could continue to reproduce itself. So you weren't worried about that? That was not for, was the forefront of our mind, no. One complication in this women's world was what to do with boy children. Some women felt that they didn't want to have kids if those kids were going to be boy kids. And that they'd be afraid of, of raising sons and having those sons grow up into an abusive, destructive, patriarchal world that they, that they then had to relinquish control over their children and see their children become men in a society like this. So some women didn't want to have male children for the best of motives. I'd been to some events, oh God, when was this? Maybe early 80s, where women who had sons weren't allowed to leave their sons in the creche. You could only leave your daughters in the creche. Um, 
that just really wound me up, stuff like that. That for me was as stupid as people only having female cats. A lot of radical feminists felt that you should give them up. There were actually women who were saying you should give up boy children. I just can't believe it now. It was so cruel and so horrible. Sue O'Sullivan's two sons were very young when she left her family to live as a lesbian. I left my sons with my husband and I went back and, and would stay there three, three times, four times a week. And you know, so I was never out of contact and never not caring um, for them at all. But it, it did pull me apart at the time and it certainly obviously pulled other people in my family apart too. Some separatists were forced to make an agonising choice between their sons and their politics. Linda Bellos chose politics. Had I been able to take my son to a separatist house, I would have taken my children with me. The reason I left and left both my children was that uh, boys weren't allowed. And I could not, and I would not, even today, I mean, I obviously find this quite painful, but I, I could not leave my son and take my daughter. So my feeling was that it would be better for the children to stay together with their father. There's no doubt their father loved them. So that was a huge decision to become a separatist in that context. I didn't choose to become a separatist. It kind of went with my politics and it went with that stage. The revolutionary feminists analyzed the cause of women's oppression. For them, it was male violence that kept women in their place. Penile imperialism was the rule and control over women under male dominance through the wielding of the penis. I mean, a clear way is um, indecent exposure in the street. But it also it's rape and all other forms of sexual violence. And it's what keeps women off the streets, frightened in their homes. Really, it's force and threat of force that keep men individually and collectively in power over women. That's the big one. And we started analysing all the different forms that male violence against women took. I used to work in the NHS. I was a nurse and I worked in casualty. And I there saw, over a period of just a few weeks, and most of the women that were coming in were there because of something directly that a man had done to them or to the people that they loved. So you had young girls coming in with suicide attempts because they'd been let down so badly, or because of abuse, you know, domestic violence victims, you know, women in really bad situations, and almost exclusively there because of what some man had done. One proposition summed up the Rev Femme's analysis. It was that any man could be a rapist. All men are potential rapists means that when a woman is on the underground or in the street, she doesn't know which man is likely to act as a rapist towards her. So she actually has to be, as the majority of women are, cautious towards all men. She doesn't know who the man behind her is on the street, so she'll be looking out for the lights of the next house, she'll be putting the keys between her fingers and so on. So just because that individual man may feel like a cuddly sort of person, uh, she is not in a position to read that. So that's what all men are potential rapist means, in fact. A man entered the bedroom of the Queen of this country and frankly could have raped her. I'm glad to say that thankfully he did not, at least it, not reported that he did. But if somebody as well protected and well regarded could be subject to the threat of violence, if not actual violence, where did it put us all? The mere threat of rape has an impact on all women. It does not require all men to be rapists for all women to be afraid of rape. It was no coincidence that the revolutionary feminists in Leeds focused on male violence. It was in and around Leeds in the late 70s that the Yorkshire Ripper was committing his terrible crimes against women. In 1979, he'd already butchered 10 women and was still at large. In response, in 1980, the revolutionary feminists set up an organization called WAVOR, Women Against Violence Against Women. 
the first thing they did was to reclaim the night. Just the phrase, reclaim the night, who were you reclaiming it from? From men. <laughs> reclaim the night began when the Yorkshire Ripper was stalking the streets of West Yorkshire. And we were told by police not to be out on our own late at night. So there was effectively a curfew on women. Among our slogans were, women demand the right to walk the streets at night. Uh, what do we want, an end to male violence? When do we want it? Now. A lot of women were just really angry by the, this curfew on women that was in operation, by the, the control that men seemed to have on women not being able to walk alone at night. We were damned if we were going to follow advice that police gave us and either ask a man to accompany us, remember that man could well be a sexually violent man himself, um, or stay in. Why wasn't there a curfew on men? Why wasn't it that men were told, be at home by 8 o'clock or account for your whereabouts? That was far more important in terms of keeping women safe. It was very strengthening. We had flaming torches and we marched down the street shouting, women demand the right to walk the streets at night and <laughs> other such. And it was at the time when um, the pubs were just emptying and so groups of men were coming out of the pubs, a bit beery and so on, and we were shouting at them, oh, what's this? It felt really powerful. Don't However we dress, wherever we go, yes means yes and no means no. However we dress, wherever we go, no means no, means no, means no. There were liberals who said yes means yes and no means no, but we decided that actually just no would do. Well, can I just say this to you, look? I don't mind you demonstrating, but don't block the payment up and don't block the entry to somebody else's premises. At the heart of the Rev Femme's analysis of male violence lay pornography. For them, pornographic imagery endorsed and encouraged violent behaviour. In Women Against Violence Against Women, uh, we were particularly concerned to act against pornography and sexually violent films because we thought that they were indeed the propaganda of women hatred and that was where a lot of the creation of the attitudes of sexual violence came from. As revolutionary feminists, we argued, and I would still argue, that pornography is violence against women. Recognise the lesbian. Oh, and also they didn't flirt with men or simper, and they've treated men as equals, sort of slapping them on the back. In the early 80s, Sheila Jeffries returned to London from Leeds and joined the London Rev Femmes. Created, and I think they're about their lurid imaginations. Together with Linda Bellos, she set up the London Wavor Group. She's an ex-lover of mine, at the very least. Got the Summer. pair of you two together. Yeah, I know. Yeah, to imagine. Absolutely. We did, we did get some things done. <laughs> we were great. <laughs> Scary, but great. These were serious women. They, you so completely did not mess with them. They were the radical side, the more radical side of the movement. And direct action was their trademark. And so we carried stickers and badges and we'd walk along the street and stick wave all stickers on pornography. And uh, yeah, we'd have, their meetings were spectacular. You went there when you wanted a bit of action. And it was a very exciting time. We'd meet on Wednesday nights to discuss what we found most objectionable that week. It was like sort of top of the pops or kind of the news quiz or something, and then we go out and do an action on Friday night, usually against um, a movie that we found quite objectionable. We were kind of quite an engine of leaflet-making and placard-making and demonstrating. The, the whole thing that, that Wavell was saying, porn, pornography is wrong, yeah, OK? I think that was probably the thing that then really got me into Wavell. When I was straight, I'd read a lot of porn. I'd got out with this bloke who just had porn all the time. I didn't have a job, and he just had porn around, and I just read porn. Like, I'd spend the whole, like, hours of a day reading all these porn magazines. And they're just horrible, and they really, really actually... I can't say. 
they really get into your head and really sort of like it's quite not good. Some people might think if you don't want to look at pornography, you could choose to live your life without ever really looking at it or even knowing much about it. So why was it important for you to focus on it? Well, personally, I kind of didn't have that option as a child because I grew up in um, central Manhattan and I grew up in the middle of the porn industry. So every morning going to work, I had to um, walk through rows and rows of porn palaces, sex shops, peep show arcades with women in little cages, uh, like animals, kind of um, a drug to the eyeballs. Signs saying, you know, girls dancing for your pleasure, our girls do anything, you know, girls, 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 we're cheaper than the next guy. <laughs> I think I was really disturbed by what I saw day in, day out, year in, year out as a child. One of the things we did in the London group was consciousness raising around pornography and we had rules about looking at pornography. We'd acquire pornography, preferably not buying it, giving money to pornographers, but actually asking brothers and others who held pornography. And we looked at it, but we'd only look at it in the group was the anxiety that if you looked at it at home on your own that it would be arousing or that it would be no, disturbing? disturbing. Largely it was disturbing. Sometimes it was also arousing. I mean, we discussed the extent to which women had rape fantasies. You know, it happened. Many of us, almost every one of us did. You know, what was that about? Here we were, you know, strong, you know, lesbian feminists. Why are we having these fantasies? I think that's one of the things I'm really grateful to the radical feminist analysis for is that we, we talked about sex a lot and we didn't just talk about sex as in who are you going out with, giggle, giggle. We talked about the structure, the fundamental structure of sexuality in society and how it might be changed. We had weekends where we talked about sexual fantasies. You know, I don't know if young women do that today. Well, they probably do, but we did it in a very specifically political way as in kind of where do we go from here? What do we like about our sexuality? What do we want, what do we want to change? Um, it was all very, it was all really terribly exciting and, and very searching and probing. So, uh, what was the question? Oh my God. As well as marching, there were other forms of direct action, like defacing sexist posters. The poster about when you was interested in carpentry and basically the graffiti was saw his head off and it was absolutely absolutely a fantastic fantastic bit of graffiti and everybody had it up on their walls and then we found out that a man had done the graffiti and it was just like we were just like right that's it don't want no short short man don't want no short, short we were basically going to go around to his house and brick his house until we found out he lived with women and children. <laughs> so then of course we couldn't do it, yeah, because then it would actually, it would have upset them more than it would have upset him. So, so we just went around like, yeah, swearing a lot about it. A group of extremists calling themselves angry women splintered off from Wavell, becoming, as it were, their provisional wing. There were times when uh, toilets in cinemas were blocked with concrete and eggs were thrown at the screen, that kind of thing. So there was always something going on and we had really strict rules that whoever was doing it didn't tell the others and that we do not to this day know anything that was done by outsiders. I know what I was involved in and I couldn't tell you what anybody else was involved in. One heard about a militant wing of the, of the radical feminist action. But that wasn't Activism. you. Activism. That wasn't Wavo, no. There was quite extreme action taken on sex shops. Some of them were burnt down. We never burnt down sex shops, you know, that, that was happening in Leeds. And, and, and there was this whole thing, that's, yeah, that's really good, that's something you want to do. Did there you was... burn down any sex shops? No, I didn't burn down any sex shops. Even now I don't really sort of ever ever talk about it, but we would go and we would vandalise sex shops. That's, that's what we would do, yeah. Were you an angry woman in Angry Women? Yes, I'm proud to say I was. And what kinds of things were you doing? I'm not prepared to say. By the early 80s, feminism had well and truly come of age but was about to enter a second phase. Black women, working class women and disabled women felt that their oppressions had not been taken into account by the largely white middle class pioneers of the women's movement. 
This was the era of so-called identity politics. Calling yourself a feminist was no longer sufficient. I'm a working class black woman. Oh, I would have said speaking as a Jewish lesbian. I would always identify myself as a black lesbian. Oh Lord, you couldn't be involved politically in the 80s and not get involved in identity politics. There was a point system. It varied a bit. You had to work out what the local point system was, like the local currency. But there was always a point system. All over the place, women were discovering that their grandmothers were Jewish and that they'd only found out on their deathbed, or that somebody was third-generation Irish and took it on as if they were still, you know, living in Kilkenny, eating potatoes and working on a farm. Hello, Pat. Hi. Yes, the diaries came in. Well, 2000... The Bible of the women's movement at the time was Spare Rib, a high-minded feminist magazine that had been set up by educated middle-class white women. But now the women at Spare Rib were forced to take on the new politics of identity. Um, I mean, are they talking about um, helpers in terms of helping, you know, like... We started the process of changing the collective from being all white to a mixed-race collective. Spare Rib was the first institution in the women's movement that consciously did that process, and of course it was a very public institution. We more and more realise ourselves in Spare Rib that, that there are differences between women. That doesn't mean that we can't unite, that we can't fight for the same mm. things, but there are differences that we have to take account of and we have to pay attention to. When the first black women came on to Spare Rib, I think they were in a very difficult position. I don't think we were so crude as to say, OK, you go and do all the stuff with black women, we'll carry on the way we are. But we did, I think, think simply by having them on the collective, it would make things better. And I don't think that anybody predicted that it would make things a hell of a lot worse. Spare Rib invited Linda Bellos to become the first black woman to join their all-white collective. What I found... Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, good women. I enjoy working with a lot of them. Not all of them, but I enjoy working with a lot. But what I found was that they used to do these things that I used to call them feminist travel logs. In which somebody was going on holiday to somewhere for three weeks and they wanted a commission to write. The stories were always the same about smiling faces, you know, in the face of adversity. They were always the same patronising rubbish. And after a while, I started writing to say, back to them and say, no, we won't take a piece from you. However, if you're going to Nicaragua or, or South Africa or wherever, perhaps you would put us in contact with local women who can write for themselves. Then the letter would come back. They may not speak English. And I'd say, that's fine. We will have the material translated, but actually we want to hear from women in their own language, in their own words. We knew from letters that were coming from women who lived there that they desperately wanted an article written on women in El Salvador. They didn't have the time to write it. Most of them couldn't speak English. They really wanted this woman to write about their predicament, and she was being told she couldn't because she wasn't from El Salvador. Now, that was that is ridiculous. I think the sort of splits we saw on the collective um, were being echoed in women's meetings and activities, you know, up and down the UK. I, th I think that's true, but I think they were really intensified in spare rib because with the women readership was was very broad and people were continually writing into us and saying, you're not representing us. And you just put your head in your hands and say, well, who are we representing? And we didn't know how to deal with it as, as largely white feminist movement. We didn't know how to cope with that. And so we turned quite a lot on ourselves. <laughs> They suggested that we do an article um, on what it's like for blind women in the women's movement and um, particularly the Sisters Against Statement were formed because we felt excluded by the women's movement. You know, we were pretty upfront about how we would challenge it. We would shout and scream. We would stand outside with pickets, uh, with, with you know, and placards. And, uh, you know, we, we did our fair share of denouncing 
of women and, and groups who were not, um, were not actually making things accessible for us. They always used to turn up at the feminist book fairs and say, we can't get in, and, yeah. Um, did, were you supportive of that? Is this, uh, is this off the record? I can't remember. I just remember they used to sit outside in their wheelchairs and be a bit sort of threatening. Well, I think like a lot of black women, uh, disabled women suddenly got a voice and got power by virtue of the fact that they were disabled. And if you weren't disabled, just like white women couldn't, you did not say a damn word when a disabled woman spoke. That was that. It was quite aggressive uh, and it was very hysterical and very emotional. Now, I would defend the hysteria and emotion because to be excluded is not nice. If it wasn't one thing and it, it was another, I mean, if it wasn't disabled women feeling they were excluded, it was working class women feeling they were excluded. And you just felt, why am I doing this if I'm just going to get bullied? Because that's what it felt like. In the end, it felt like bullying and harassment. Identity politics were used by some people as a way to shut others up or for them to gain power. I mean, this will always happen. And it was not, in the end, positive. I can't think of anything good to say. There is something sort of Lord of the Flies-ish about it. <laughs> it was, you know, it, it became quite sinister. It was a bit Lord of the flies -y and it was a bit like... I mean, I've used the word fundamentalisms. It was a bit like a bit of a cult, where cult members end up sort of, you know, excluding each other or killing each other or, you know, just sort of turning on and turning on and turning on each other. As I said, until there's only you left. Paradoxically, it was as the women's movement was unravelling that some of its most radical ideas were being imported into municipal government. The Greater London Council set up a women's committee in 1982. Here is where the women's committee support unit used to be. Its structure echoed the concerns of identity politics with women brought in specifically to represent the issues of lesbianism, disability, class and race. This was despite the fact that Valerie Wise, head of the Women's Committee, was not herself well versed in feminist politics. Did you have a very clear feminist agenda? I probably didn't actually, to be honest. Um, I was just wanting to make a difference for, for women uh, and improving things for women here in London. I think for a, for a young woman, she dressed in a way that perhaps was kind of slightly older. She used to wear a lot of high-necked sort of Victorian blouses and very sort of straight skirts. She looked like a very straight governess. The media used to very unkindly call her olive oil. I've never worn dungarees in my life. Maybe this is my working class background coming out that I felt you had to like dress appropriately. Also I think I didn't want people to be fixated about what I was wearing and not listening to what I was saying. I didn't want any distractions from what we were about. What they were about was investing large amounts of public money in services for women. How much money did you have to spend? Over the whole period of the Women's Committee, nearly £30 million was given out in grants. In our last year, we gave £14 million out. The Equal Opportunities Commission, which covered the whole country in that same year, had a grants budget of £80,000. So that just shows, and that was national. We were London. It was fantastically exciting because it was access to power and resources for the first time, really. And there were all sorts of women working in the Women's Committee Support Unit, but there were a lot of feminists. I really couldn't bear all that town hall feminism. We called those women femocrats, I seem to remember. They were just earning their salary, doing 
bits of equal opportunities feminism between nine and five and then going home to their comfortable houses. We were always more radical than that. Kirsten Hearn, Susan Hemmings, Jan Parker, Femi Otitoju and Linda Bellos all came to work there. Although Linda had her reservations about state funding for women's activism. The fact that public money is available, it comes with strings. You'd be tied up with the bureaucracy and you'd have to have a constitution, you'd have to do this, you'd have to do that, and you'd have never any time to do the campaigning. So my advice to people is don't apply. Just do it on a shoestring. You'll keep more of your politics in place. Just because the state can fund something doesn't mean it ought to. The GLC Women's Committee gave out nearly a thousand grants in the course of its life. Nearly half of these went to childcare projects. But more surprisingly, the extreme ideas of revolutionary feminism had also been absorbed into the mainstream. One of the things that had come out when we were consulting women was women objected to sexist advertising in general, and I fully supported that view. And we, the GLC, had a close working relationship with London Transport because we funded them. And the Tubes had some really, really awful adverts, and so we decided that we would try and stop that. There are lots of advertisements that I think just show women as sex objects. There's one that says, say, knickers to panties. There's another advert that I particularly dislike that is for advertising wood tape. And again, it has a woman's nude body with the wood uh, grains markings on her body. And that just seems to be a ridiculous way of selling wood tape. Now, the way that the tabloids portrayed it was, you know, we were a bunch of kind of, you know, man-hating, ugly, frumpy killjoys. Um, but it wasn't about that. It was about trying to look at the interrelationship between images of women and then how women are treated within society. So if you are standing on your own in a dimly lit platform at night, it wasn't exactly going to enhance your sense of kind of well-being or safety to be surrounded by scantily clad images of available women or women, you know, proffering themselves up for, you know, the male jackboot, if you like. 40% uh, of women said they would not travel alone at night. And so, in other words, we now have a sort of curfew operating as far as London women are concerned at night, and I think that is a scandal. The Women's Committee campaign was successful and London Transport changed its code. But the GLC's high-profile campaigns were a constant thorn in Margaret Thatcher's side. We just sat there opposite the Parliament, just like a big seething mass. Uh, which might break out, and we did frequently break out, march across Westminster Bridge, <laughs> just be complete nuisances. I can quite understand why, you know, the woman thought that, that has to go, they must stop it. The GLC was abolished by Margaret Thatcher in 1986 in a very effective bid to stamp out oppositional politics. Many women's organisations lost their funding and were forced to shut up shop. County Hall was sold and is now owned by a global hotel chain. I think what the GLC did was largely to fund the women's movement out of existence. As a movement, we became heavily dependent on funding. We would, we'd stopped being activists, we became post holders. And when that funding fell apart, a lot of us had lost the skills and lost the politics that said the key to your future is in your own hands and that you and you alone have responsibility to work with others to change it. That ethos had disappeared. What happened to revolutionary feminism? Did it lose the argument? I think what happened to revolutionary feminism has a lot in common with what happened to feminism and what happened to left to the left in the 1980s because all these visionary movements of change were very much challenged in the 1980s by the forces of reaction that were embodied in corporations and, and government and very powerful forces. So in that sense, 
no, we were not successful. But when you consider how much influence we had as just a few hundred women who went out on the street with placards, it's extraordinary that we achieved what we did. Today, Sheila Jeffries is still an activist and campaigns against the sex industry internationally. Linda Bellos went into mainstream Labour politics and became leader of Lambeth Council in 1986. She now runs a training consultancy specialising in diversity. I really passionately felt those politics and I haven't changed. I haven't lost my passion or my clarity about what that was about. I share it today. I just choose not to put my energy there because it's not the right time. Are you still an angry woman? I'm pretty angry about a lot of things, yes, and I endeavour to do what I can. Would you still describe yourself as a revolutionary feminist now? It would depend who I was talking to. I think I would just call myself a feminist in most situations now. Are you still a separatist? Oh, am I still a separatist? <laughs> no. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not still a separatist, yeah, but I'm still lesbian. <laughs> I'm still pretty rabid, but I probably temper my rabidness in different language. Well, I've become a Buddhist since then. I'm a active member of the organisation Justice for Women, which campaigns for legal reform around domestic violence and supports women who have killed their violent husbands. I'm a journalist and I also do research into sexual violence. I live in Preston in Lancashire, so I've gone from a large, you know, capital city to a very small city. Um, and I work in domestic violence. I'm the director of Preston Women's Refuge. Do you identify as a feminist? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, all my life I would have, I would have said yes, but I don't think anybody ever really asks me anymore. Mm. No, I think it's an important question mm. since it's kind of well on its way to becoming a sort of extinct species. Men grow bold as they grow old. They all lose their charms in the end. All men are wankers, said Christabel Pankhurst. Women are a girl's best friend. Time rolls on and youth is gone and you can't straighten up when you bend. But stiff back or stiff knees, you stand straight as teeth.